I was approached about Dr. Daniel Wood's transcript or manuscript. Um, I got extremely excited at the moment because the big project for the east side of Hudson was Dr. Cornelius Osborne. I spent 10 years transcribing his manuscript of recipes and stuff, which was dated around 1760. And I had a good understanding of the philosophy that that doctor was practicing as a local. And I had a very good understanding of Dr. Colden. And Dr. Daniel Wood gave me the opportunity to look at a physician that was actually learned, trained in medicine about 15, 20 years after Dr. Osborne. So understanding Dr. Wood and Dr. Osborne, you're able to see what kind of trends and changes occur in medicine during the colonial period. And this is a critical point because it's just before the Revolutionary War. And in the Revolutionary War, we know that massive changes occurred in medical philosophy and what was being practiced because the practice was limited by the people who were in charge, the military itself, and what kinds of medicine could be practiced, would be practiced, what kinds of surgeons would be hired, what kinds of medicines would be ordered and put into storage for practice there. Well, at that time, there were two, at least two major traditions of medicine. There was, there was the British-based uh, Western European philosophy, which everybody reads about today when we read Revolutionary War history. And there was the Eastern and Central European philosophy, or German philosophy, which you don't really learn much about. Well, it ends up that Dr. Daniel Wood was practiced in the last type, the German or the German teachings and the uh, Latin teachings of Central and Eastern Europe. So when I saw that, that was what got me so excited because I said, there are people, I knew there were people, there, but I, did, I had not yet seen an example. This person was telling us, unfortunately not English, his philosophy of disease and how he was treating. Fortunately, most of it is in Latin, so I was able to translate that more quickly. The German is scribble, and it's actually a mixed German, because German is in German like we think of it today. It was Moravian plus Bohemian, other concepts, and he would mix some Latin into his German, sometimes and vice versa or his common ver verbiage that they used in his county into there. So transcribing the uh, German parts were a little bit harder. And, uh, but the, the, when I, and I spent the first few days look, looking at that. And then when I finally got to the, to the med medical writings, I said, oh, this is easy. This is a pocket carry. And then I was sent some new, new photos. And I said, oh my god, here's the philosophy. Oh, this is easy. Wow, there's, there's keywords in here that can be traced because there were new discoveries every few years in medicine, every year practically. And when a new term comes in and becomes popular, there are ways to look these things up, so I did. If it's a new term, you look for the dissertation that announced it to the world, for example. You look at the founder, the one who discovered it, and you look at the people who promoted it heavily. And you have to just have to end up learning who those college professors' names are for medical school. And so that's the route I took to understand the manuscript. And that process, I don't, I can't tell you how long it took. It took me a year. It, it feels like forever. It feels like it was continuous for the last three weeks, 24 hours a day. Yeah, because, you haven't slept, right? <laughs> yes. But, um, but so much was coming together and like the key, understanding the key words, because I left the Latin to last. I had to catch up now, I felt. It took me forever to not learn much about the German part in. So, so um, the first question that came to mind when I was trying to summarize what I thought of it, what do we think Daniel Wood represents? And based upon what I've been told and what I've seen and what I've read like in his pension files and stuff, the historian from Illinois thinks of him, well, he's the father of John Wood, the 11th governor of Illinois. That's, who, that's why he's important to us. Family descendant who sent a letter to the pension for the pension files writes in there, 
his, his or her interest on the link to the American Revolution. I want to prove my, my personal heritage, D-A-R, S-A-R. So family descendants will look at him that way. A genealogist will look at him more culturally and fully and religiously and family-wise and community-wise and, and go through this, this long reiteration of where he comes from and he, that his family is a Puritan. It was associated with Governor John Winthrop's you know, set up of the future state of Connecticut or a colony of Connecticut and that oh yeah Daniel Wood was a member of that of those Puritans who set up Connecticut and all these other utopian settlements over in Long Island up in Schenectady across the state um, in little habitats here and there that they can find. A Revolutionary War historian no, and I'm surprised that Wood is not better known in Revolutionary War history because his uh, service as a physician was actually top-notch and different, but it was probably too different if they were at all sensitized by the fact that he was speaking German and that he had read all that, that ridiculous German writings that we're not really paying attention to in our medical schools. So that's possibly why. Maybe he just thought differently or he so associated with the people differently. He came to serve for a good reason. The reason was that he could understand the Hessian soldiers who were captured in Trent. He was the only one who could probably translate very well between the soldiers and the military. And that's what, that's what, that's what attracted him to serving from that point on, was that very first experience of, wow, I'm the only one who can talk to them. <laughs> you know, they could, they could, they, they can come from one area or another over there in the German-speaking area, but I can still translate their slightly different German, and I can tell the, the leaders here what, the, what they need. And I can talk to them due to their injuries and their need for care. So that was the most, one of the most important things about him. As, a, as myself, as a, I, I would think, I hadn't come up with a name for this until I made the slide. I guess I call myself a sociomedical historian. There, I'm a medical historian who looks at the medical history, but who looks at the sociocultural influences on the individual. I don't call all the other forms of medicine what they're commonly known as. So the steps that I take in looking up an individual, I'm more a biographical genealogist historian than a medical historian because I look at people's history and what makes them up and what their culture is like, what the persona is like. So I look up personal history, I look up the family and how it changes across generations over time. How many Wood family members married, in, in, married some Native American or married into another culture, Daniel Wood married into another culture. And then I look at what were the professional teachings and professional social pressures put on you to be what you're supposed to be to your community as a doctor or whatever. And there tends to be a biasness towards the term quackery and quacks that perpetuate medical history in America. Even from almost its very beginning, say about 1850, when you start reading the med medical history books written by Americans. And that goes back to this famous quote. You, if you just look up this quote on the internet, look at how many people mention it. Few physicians among us are eminent for their skill. Quacks abound like locusts in Egypt, and too many have recommended themselves to a full and profitable practice in subsistence. That's by the historian William Smith, 1757, The History of New York. And that is the most quoted thing in any traditional medical history journal you find starting about 1850 in the New York Academy of Medicine library, which, ha which has a journal, New York Medical Journal, or New York, uh, yeah, New York the Journal of Medicine, or I can't remember exactly the name of it. And it's discussed by a, a historian I grew up learning in the early years of medical history, Richard Schreier. And it's in the American, so there's some sources down here that you can go look at, American Antiquarian Journal. And John B. Beck is the 1850. New York doctor, I, I believe he was practicing up in Albany in charge of the county up there for a while. 
he wrote the history of medicine in New York, and he uses that quote. But if you follow at the lines after it, you see why it's not a good thing to look at. And a few lines after it, he says, to protect the lives of the king's sub subjects from the malpractice of the pretenders. So the English are saying, you can practice medicine in the English colony in New York, but you can only practice it the way the English will let you, and George will let you. And so that biasness is found throughout our medical history, and our early 1900s historians who have written the local histories here carry on that bias when they write. And I, now I'm looking at this, their sources, and I can pick out the amount of bias that they start off with. The, the fault of that is that that's why you don't know about herbalists, except by another historian. That's why you don't know about the full history of homeopathy. This is like one of the most important counties in the state for homeopathy. And, and, new, and, this, and nobody really knows that. First, first major and last major homeopathic hospital in these standings here in this county. So the second part of Daniel Wood that I looked at was, his, was the parts of his family as he grew up. And I defined his family as the parts that are detailed here, childhood years, his apprenticeship years, his war years. And um, then I looked at his life after the military. The, and I try to understand him by looking at that. And we can't tell much about uh, his childhood, but there is some insights that came from some of the historical documents. And we could, uh, the most important thing was how did he become a doctor? How did he learn it? And you get that from the manuscript, you can deduce the books he read, but who was teaching him? And, uh, and even at this moment, I'm only feeling like 90 to 95 percent certain I know the route he took to becoming certified as a doctor. And, I went through three-fourths of the work on that. It was a totally unnecessary, but has to be done. Looking at all the school books to find out if he was a student. That takes quite some time. There was an insight that into his, his childhood that came from John's Wood, John Wood's ancestors, his, the son of Daniel, who started up Illinois, who first settled Illinois, Quincy. Um, and in an article about, about the ancestry, it mentions Daniel Wood, his birth date, his captain and surgeon, his service as a captain and surgeon in the war. And then it says, he not only spoke German and read German, but also wrote a book in German. Okay, I say, okay, yeah, of course, I saw the manuscript. Dr. Daniel Wood married Miss Catherine Krauss, a German girl who was born up in Mohawk Valley. I kind of knew that too, but that was after the war, after he learned medicine. The present state of the book. She never learned to speak English and died when her son, the founder of Quincy, was about five years old. So, okay, so he, he married a German-speaking person, and we still don't know exactly why. Did he fall in love with the culture as a child? Was he raised with German-speaking people? Was he at a German-speaking school? Or did he get schooled temporarily with some German-speaking children? Or were Germans the neighbors? We don't know. So in the genealogy, I ended up finding in archives.org library, um, which is it's totally separate from the other one you see with Google and such. The, the, the archives had a manuscript in there done by a type a typed manuscript done by a genealogist who was focusing on the Wood family, in particular his his group, and he gives the lineages, and I can see where Dan, Daniel Wood comes up. Of course, the issue with genealogy things is there might be skipped parts or something like that, or parts that aren't linked, that are shown as linked and could be wrong, but it gave me a lead. And it also gives you more of the cultural history and heritage. Again, the Wood family came in as Puritans of English rising, English birth, and what in the heck made Daniel Wood turn towards Eastern and Central Ger uh, European 
German traditions and teachings is the question. So I, looking at the, the family history and where they lived and what, who, anybody else in the family learned German? I, have, I did not see that. But when you trace the family, you find they're very big out in Long Island, very big out in Southampton, very big in Connecticut, a few other places. They were all, they were all developing their villages and communes. And in those communes, it ends up another unique book that I was lucky to have and did not know the value of, but I went through it in detail about 20 years ago and took notes and tried to make sense of it because it's not indexed and figure out, okay, well, how can I make use of this book? And it's Asclepius Comes to the Colonies. It was written by and privately published by a doctor. And it, he went through all the papers, the same types of stuff us genealogists do. He looked at the hard copies, the microfilms, et cetera, and he quoted everything into his books, and then he turned that into a book. And it, that's Asclepius Comes to the Colonies. And it's the best insight but it's all like thousands and thousands of tidbits of information put together. And I went there through there looking for names. Who's associated with New York, practicing what? And yes, Jonas Wood of, the Wood of that Wood family genealogy tree got permission to be a doctor in 1677 on Long Island at Huntington by, by General Court of Assizes. I guess that's how you say it. And this is what the court document said, how he was allowed to be a doctor. And there being likewise no other surge in, in these parts, the court have received full satisfaction of the abilities of the said Mr. Wood in that faculty. This, the general court of the sizes, you would have people show up with you. Your, in fact, you would have your whole community show up. And there would be two witnesses and a community and they say, we want him to be our doctor. We want him to be officially allowed, I believe it was by King James law. He had just passed an act saying that King James Act says that you can't be a doctor unless you're allowed to be a doctor. You can't practice. And that was about 11 years before that. So this was a reaction to that within this colonial <coughs> setting to, to get themselves a doctor. So Jonas Wood. He's, uh, he's the first one in the Wood family that we have definite evidence that he was practicing as a doctor as well as whatever other services he offered his community. A related document, next paragraph in that book, is of another one in that Puritan community, John Stewart, about 14 years later, who needs also permission to practice and, and there's the key word, to follow the trade of a cooper as also to practice the art of surgery. So he's a cooper until somebody needs a surgeon. And then he's approved by the court to be a surgeon. So, that's, so that makes it possible for all of the communes set up in, the, in this valley, every place north of New York, to become a doctor as long as you're count, the person in charge of your your county legally allows you to and makes a, makes a statement doesn't have to pass it as an act so so yes now the, the we know a little bit about it we know a lot about his military life and we have the months it takes to read through it <laughs> read through all the original documents but here here is a summary of it that I produced, as I see it, based upon his declaration in 1832 to declare that he, yes, he did serve in the war so that they could, the family could benefit from the pension file that he had, he, the monies he had earned. And the individual who was at that would have been Dr. William Shipple, who he would have been the one who was at the place where Dr. Wood was working and saw him this day that this particular part of the declaration was written. He said, yes, there being no surgeon, I did this and that. And then when, I, when it was over with, I asked about my leaving physician and the Surgeon General walked by and said, no, I think you're doing really well. Just stay there in that position until we figure out what we're gonna do next. So that Dr. William Shippen 
who gave him the permission to continue that position. So, so at first I looked at this as, well, maybe if they gave it to him the position as a test, and Shippen then proved it, and that's it. Well, that's actually pretty mean. He, he, was, he, was, better, he was better than that because he started rendering medical assistance to the Hessians who were hurt. So it had more to do with the way he fit in with the community and the culture and the needs at the moment. And he was smart enough to know two philosophies, if he did know the British training. And therefore, he would serve exceptionally well, which this is the reason why I was surprised that, geez, he's not really famous now for that. And then these are the steps I went through to look up his professional education. I don't have to go through that in any length. I went through Harvard documents. Harvard's go back to 1620, 1650, Yale, King's College, Queen's College did, is in New York, but it did not exist at that time. There was a small school down in uh, Carolina's area by, by Wissenthal, nothing happened with that. The New York Medical College hadn't yet opened under uh, Samuel Bard, so, so um, he couldn't have gone to medical school. He could have gone to college in New York, and he could have gone to Philadelphia Medical School, but he didn't. And we thought that if any school, he would, might have gone to Philadelphia. And did he go to European schools of training? Well, that I just didn't want to try to even try to answer to look for his name. Did he travel back? He could have when he was a kid, been sent back to the old family, but I think he would have been sent to Huntington, Long Island, and uh, gone to the academy there that his other members of his family used. And he would have prepped for medical school by learning common languages all the stuff that you would learn in the colonial school at that time, which would be foreign languages, classical writings, etc. He's not, also important is he's not found in the New York Medical Association that was formed in the southern, the southern tier was the southern part of Hudson Valley. They, that's the first group to form. They have records and they gave the old Revolutionary War colonial lot MDs honorary MD degrees from the new schools after, he, after 1800. He, he never received a, a post-service MD degree from the association. And the other associations of other types of medicine were also co co forming um, roughly around 1820 to 1835, and none of those have him listed in their, their memberships listing their business directories. And so far, I've found no newspapers that indicate him after the war serving as a doctor, and then stipulating what kind of doctor he was. Especially after 1820, you would see them advertising about, you know, he would, you would either be a regular doctor or a reformed doctor, and you call yourself that reformed name, like Thompsonian, eclectic, herbal, botanic. So his manuscript, that's, that's where I really looked at his to determine his knowledge base, his background, etc. What did he say and how did he say it? And like I said, I spent so much time on the German part, which is just a few pages I got. And it's all, it has things like giving an enema with milk and sugar, uh, plastering something on the body that had milk in, in it. Uh, the, the, the thing, I'll say thing, people or animal being treated had milk <coughs> fever, and it was not the milk fever we get after a bacteria organism that was discovered in 1860, 1870. It was a fever that came upon the body of someone pregnant who delivered, who then, in preparation, <coughs> pre-milk, pre-milk breastfeeding, would develop a fever. So he's talking about that, but the question then becomes, is he talking about the cow having the fever, which was more common, or was he talking about the, an actual woman that he was a doctor of, doctor for, delivering? And I still don't know the answer to that. It, because he's so brief in what he's saying, it, 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 sat, it holds for, for women patients as well as cow, cattle. Uh, the last two, it's just a brief line on here's how you treat the overflow of milk, here's how you treat the lack of milk coming out. And in the middle is how to put them to sleep, you know, if, if they're stressed after the delivery or something like that. 
give them poppy and camphor. And that is a generic recipe and it's used for people, as well as cattle, apparently. I guess opium would work on a cow. And that's the only thing that points to human patient. But it's such a brief writing and it's in German. And uh, the assumption is that it was done in the 1750s, or yeah, 1750s, 1760s, somewhere around there. But it could have been done after he married the German lady. Could have been notes that they kept when they had the dairy farm in upstate New York. So, in, the, in that particular page, there are things that are marked and circled. Those are the key words. Um, and the translations are on the left. Then, this is a, one of the medical pages. And the medical pages, like I said, told me a lot more. Caveat M-E-D-I-C-G, Venisect. That G really had me going for a day or two. It ends up he does something called uh, abbreviating words, and he uses an ending. And the way in colonial times, like Dr. Osborne across the river did, is you abbreviate it with the last letter raised, or the last two letters raised. And here, he just puts a G there or what looks like a G, a squiggle G. <laughs> Anytime there's a squiggle G, it's the rest of the word. You, I know what I'm talking about, you know? <laughs> so, so this is a section on venous section or bleeding for pur purgative and, and irritating. So the concept is he's, 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 he's bleeding the person, giving them something to make them throw up or clear the gut. And something that's irritating, it could be irritating the skin or irritating the surface of the body. And the whole purpose is to do something with something on the inside. You go further on down and he's talking about warmth in human. He's talking about the air. So the concept is the warm human air is causing this person to be sick. I had to bleed her. I had to put this plaster on her, irritated her or whatever. And then he, here he's talking about an exponent or ex, ex, um, uh, the of his bath. So putting her into something that will make her sweat out, whatever it is, the vapors for cure, pal pal for palliation, for cure. So he's sweating out the vapors for the cure. And the lungs, so he wants the lungs to be clear too. So it could be like, you know, a quick, if it had mixed vapor rum in there, we'd understand it better, <laughs> you know, if it had mental rum. Down further, in the state of morbidity, which is dying, the patient is so sick that she's dying, there's this key word here, and when I saw this word, I could look that up, I found the dissertation, I was right. Saponacea, soap. The theory that you put, that you give people herbs, that act like soap or medicines that act like soap and help cleanse and flush the blood vessels. Not just the intestines, but the blood vessels. And that was a, a theory of a popular, to both British and non-British cultures, <coughs> Herman Burrave, who was, who was Central European and satisfied both the, the Eastern European and the Western European cultures. And so we have, we have Burravian people preaching medicine in the Hudson Valley in the 1750s, like Dr. Osborne, but also Dr. Wood was Arabian, preaching in the 1760s. And the key indicator is that saponation they use, because Burrave is the one who popularized soap cleansing of blood vessels concept. The vapors are still mentioned down here. See alvi fluxing. So that alvi is the gut, the intestines, and fluxing is making it flow. So the concept was, there were two types of soaps they gave you back then. There was the soap that was made by nature, herbs and all that kind of stuff, and natural minerals. And you take it, and however we give it to you, it does something. It goes into your blood and cleanses you, or it goes into your gut and cleanses you. And then the other was Vienna soap, man-made soap. Artificial soap is what they called it back then. So they had natural and artificial slope. And then you, so, and you see all of that on this, because then I tear these three pages apart. There's the natural soaps and the artificial soaps. Here's obstruction, obs, 
Obstructo Sanator, How to Make an Obstruction Healthy, uh, Foment and Bab is an external application. You want it, you have contraction of fibers that you want to mend on the inside. So you, you get, I give them a medicine to stop them from contracting and spasming in the inside so that the body will clear and let oh, everything eva evacuate out. And uh, then the body would be reformed or cured. Here's a, a obstruction being cured. And he, what's interesting here is he, there's, a, there's something called impactu rela, retro polario. Retro polario means, retro is backwards. So the concept they had back then was blood flows through the vessels and probably through the gut, but I didn't see that in here. And on the right side, it says retro pulsing. So the, the theory was if the heart isn't beating hard enough, the blood is going to start flowing backwards down your arms and legs. And then your vital force, which is in the blood, your prima V, can't go to the feet, tip of your feet, and your feet get gangrene. So retropulsing was important. So massage, water cure, veins were little processes that they did. And the purpose of bleeding was to empty the chamber down there on the ankle so we can get the blood to flow. Dr. Osborne did that too. A woman who came in and was not having her period, she was late, rather than say, oh, you know, you could be pregnant. Dr. Osborne said, okay, let's work on the, the, the energy flow here, so to speak. Now bleed your foot, and then that'll get the blood to flow. And then when the blood flows, things will clear out better and out will come your menstrual flow as well. And um, on the right side here, the other key word to point out is anti-phlogistics. Phlogistics, when you read the medical historians, because they haven't looked at the philosophy apparently close enough, when you look at the history of phlogistic philosophy, they say there's something made up in the alchemical period about something, they didn't know what it was, but they made up something that would cause sickness. So you get a tumor growing somewhere, or you have a wound that becomes infected. It's a, it's a phlogistic problem. Phlogiston is causing it. The element phlogiston, we have to get rid of that. And the way it was taught when I was learning history of medicine was that, yeah, so you have to figure out what's the phlogiston and how to get rid of it. That's not really what it is. What it is is that Phlogiston causes things to die, go gangrene, and become morbid. And it could be anything in your imagination, because sometimes phlogiston is white and like concrete, and he uses that word in here, becomes concrete. So it's a scab that's going past the scab and become pussy. Going past pus, and now it's become a hard, scabby, whitish, black thing. That, that would be a phlogiston. Or if you have a cancer growing in a bone and it comes up to the skin and the doctor sees it, that's a phlogiston. Anything that is growth and ma massive and you can't explain it is a phlogiston. And so you use anti-phlogistons to cure it. So he has the anti-phlogiston, the dilute, diluter of the blood to make it thinner so it will flow, and the refrigerant to cool down the heat from the inflammation. And then in the center here is a page on inflammation, the theory of inflammation. There are two things that cause disease, inflammation and, and the uh, fever induced by whatever is making your body change. And he says here, arteris sanguiferis minimi. That's the artery, blood in the artery flow is minimum, causes inflammation. And important in this part was that I saw that he recognized the blood has two parts serum and red blood cells. That started around 1740, 1750. And by 1760, he was saying, oh yeah, there's two parts to blood. That means that when they do bloodletting, they put it in the dish, they set the dish aside on the table, they come back an hour later and look at it. How did it split? If it split into two parts cleanly, you were healthy. If it didn't, it was because you had Nowadays, we say it's because you had neutrophils in there, and eosinophils, and blood doesn't dis dispense, disperse into layers anymore. And so you're not healthy today because we know that's a, that's a neutrophil. That's not good for you. Back then, they didn't know about neutrophils. So they just said it didn't disperse. So you got black 
humor in your blood, and that's that little black layer, which is actually the, uh, I think it was the eosinophils. So, so <coughs> was phlogiston and antiphlogiston wrong? No, it was another terminology for the same observation. And they could make that observation in the, in the dish that took the blood. And that is in the books. And the, the way to do that is in the books at the time. So if you were a doctor and you read the book, you read, oh yeah, the blood splits? Huh, I'm going to have to look for that. When you read the history of Revolutionary War, you don't necessarily see any of that detail because the historians haven't been through it to see that that was possible. Um, and he had the books to read, read it when it was possible. And then this one, this is just one of the pages. It has all these chemical symbols on it, circles, and circle with a dash through it, and a triangle, and all that. Triangle pointed down is water. These are alchemical symbols. And so he taught, he was taught apothecary. And he's probably taught by a person learned in apothecary and using those symbols. Or he read the book, but I don't think he just read. I think some doctor had to say, yeah, you know apothecary. And that, I believe, is different than the doctor who said, yes, you know what the blood is now and what information is. That's a different doctor. And then the local herbal stuff, this would be a type of book that he w could have read. I don't know if he read it. But it had, the important part was it has the word phlogista in the herbs. So to understand the theory of phlogista, you look for herb books that have phlogista, and if you know what the herb does, unfortunately you have to know the herbs in. But that's been what I've been studying for 20 years, so I said, I'm gonna go find out which herbs are good for phlogistics, you know? <laughs> and, and that's, so mallow, and I go, oh my God, he has syrup, mallow, all through his his, his uh, recipes. So, so yeah, he's definitely adhering to phlogistic theories of disease, which means that he believes there's something in there infecting you, and it's interfering with the humors and the life force flow of the body. And he wants to keep everything balanced in terms of flow through the blood. He doesn't want retro flow. He's going to do massage. He's going to do baths. He's going to do sweats. He's going to do... So that's the way he's thinking. It's all based upon phlogiston theory, nothing else. A little bit of humors and stuff implied from So then I basically, for myself, had summarized this up. Hopefully, if you looked at it, you'd be able to understand some of it. I explained it to you, but try to remember all this stuff I just mentioned. And here's, here's the letter about his service in his pension files to summarize what kind of role, what his life was like as a, as a surgeon. So then, after the war, I wanted to quick, I quickly went through more of his history after the war of the last week or two. And um, I had these questions I started with and what, you know, how did he meet his wife, wife Catherine afterwards? And did he have a, a wife right around the war time too? I don't know. These are still things being explored. Here's some background on the German Palatine. And this is important if anybody here wants to look up palatinate. Um, doc, Dr. Daniel Wood is on the right, and his wife lived up in St. Johnsonville near one of the Finger Lakes. Dr. Daniel lived way over, not even near the Finger Lakes, is she? More over the Mohawk River. And he's over at the, he lived in two places at the base of the two, two of the Finger Lakes. And where he served is in the lower right of this map, Newburg. Served and with plans of serving in Minisink, but by the time he got to Minisink, his service ended because they condensed the troops more and they didn't need him in the troops. So this is this is the part of New York where he lived, or where he lived and served and married, and, and these are the Palatinate uh, cultures, and all of the ones that are highlighted have names that are associated with the, the Hudson Valley. So we have the Hessian soldiers, we have the Wurzboro people, we have the Upper Palatinates, which were um, associated with the Huguenots, and we have the, the recognizable hamlet of Wurtemberg, which is up by Rhinebeck, 
and Rhinebeck and Kingston are palaces. So, so the, the cultural links are pretty obvious and explain what somehow, somehow how he grew up learning German and why he married a Palatinate afterwards. So another question I have, I won't go through it in much detail here, was how similar is he to the other doctors I was looking at across the river? It ends up that between 1775 and 1806, there were like six to 12 transitions in how you can become a doctor. There was a law passed, and then there were rules set, and there was act, then there were acts passed, and the county had a rule, and then, then the governor of the state passed a law, and then he assigned a committee to approve you, and, and then the committee solidified it more and said you have to write something, whereas beforehand you did write something, but it wasn't formally required, etc. So these are all different doctors of the same time, of that time span, so I can compare, or we can compare, what these doctors had to do and became and finished to be a doctor, what they what kind of medicine they practiced as that doctor, with with Wood and see how he lived through their lifespans. And these these doctors ended up dying, and he's still practicing in 18, 1830, or he's still alive in the 1830s. But uh, Thomas Osborne actually is still alive. And then I compared him to other physicians, and I compared him to And I compared them to our positions in this county. That's the time. We're, we're at 35 now. Yeah. So some other pages that give you some background on resources. Now, the Palatine, Palatines, when they came over, with the, we looked at we just looked at the, Pur, the Puritans. And their concept of how they made how their doctors got became doctors. They would be approved by the by uh, the king or whoever the king said could approve them. When the Palatines, and this is this is 1710 that this happens, uh, that this book was written, describe what their perfect little Palatine community would be that moved to New York. When they moved to New York, and we have one of these Palatine settings, the Newburgh area. So a perfect community had, this, in this case, 1,200 people, two of whom were surgeons. So we can pretty much surmise that the Palatine utopian groups that were here, but we don't know much about, they had to have had one or two surgeons, doctors and surgeons, and not, not loosely defined herbalists, or mothers who could also be an herbalist in the midwife. Not, those were there too, but they definitely had, a, had some sort of surgeon who was officially recognized, may have been recognized back in the old country, but was practicing here. So, but we, they're not easy to find. This particular individual, Reverend Joshua Cockadall, is the one who set up the Palatine communities here. And, put, and he was at the one in Newburgh for a few days or weeks, lived up in Albany. This particular book is about the Palatines of Carolina. And that's actually this is his his book declaring the the value of the community and purpose and stuff. This is an important document to be familiar with. This is King the King George II Print Practical Practice of Physics Act, dated 10th of June 1760. This is the reason why Dr. Woods, or Daniel Woods, um, had to go through a particular process. And this rules out a lot of the informal apprenticeships that he could have had before this in the 1750s. So in the 1760s, since he, um, he was learning at that time, he had to conform with King George's Act. And so he had to, he had to be duly examined by a physician surgeon or physician surgeon uh, who would then approve him to be a physician or surgeon or physician and surgeon. And then state get the day and year that he's confirmed. And there's the entire act from the laws of New York. And looking at the family, there's two groups in Orange County, the northern and southern population. 
and this and he's in the southern population groups and these are the doctors that are down there by Goshen and they they were in better contact I believe with New York City than the northern groups were but the New York City the New York the northern groups were very English and they were very very much in contact with the city already as their family came to Livingston and stuff so so the question in my mind was I know about the Livingston or what about the Southerns? Well, John Gale was the key to, the, to understanding this history. There are four families that are in court, Whitman, Gale, Pearson, and Tustin. I don't know if that's how you say Tustin. But those are the four family physicians, or what would the word be for that? Family doctors, or doctor, doctor's families. There are doctor's families all over the region that stayed within the family, and usually it's doctors treating sons or teaching sons or grandsons or, or nephews to be doctors. That was common. And then when the act got passed, it was like, now it has to be official. So now we've got the official family leaders who are the oldest doctor in the family, and he has to approve it. And they started to formalize it and then say, okay, it can't just be approved by a family member because that's favoritism. So where you have to show your physician skill, your apothecary skill, your surgical skill if you want to be a surgeon. And we're going to have to get an expert in each one of those. So in the, in the South, that's what Wood's family actually went, went about doing. As you can see from his notes, he was, he was apothecary trained in medical training. And he was trained Eastern Central European, not Western, because he wasn't focusing on physiology, anatomy, and Eastern terminology. So Benjamin Tustin, down in, of Goshen, Jr., the son of Senior, to learn medicine, he had to first go over to Jamaica, Long Island, the uh, Palatine, or the, uh, the, uh, what is the their, their communal setting that was over there. So uh, he, he, learned, he learned from his uncle's school, which they called Jamaican, which they called an academy. He, he learned there, and then he came back to the Goshen area and learned under Dr. Thomas Wickman. And I'm not sure who, who or what medicine Dr. Thomas Wickman, Wickman is immediately associated with. My guess would be apothecary. And then Bar, Dr. Dr. Barnett in Newark, New Jersey. And the, it ends up that the uh, Gale family has major leaders, military, uh, J Justice with the JDs over in New Jersey. So there must have been some association going on there. Thomas Jones, the, uh, the British, he was a little bit more British in his, uh, his philosophy. And, um, and then he became a doctor in 1769, about the same time as, as Daniel Wood. And, and just to note, ben, this is Benjamin Tustin, who was the uh, leader of the third Orange County militia, who was killed at the Battle of Lansing. Mm -hmm. Then there's some other families that have loose associations. Uh, Nathaniel Elmer has has more known about him than some other documents. Du Bois is, is uh, or Du Bois, the uh, the civil way of saying that last name <laughs> in this country my neighbors tell me that the boys family of Warwick are French descent but removed from the French by the French themselves so you don't know if they practice French medicine or English medicine. French medicine would have been learned at the College of Paris. Rosencrantz would have been German from the name so Palatine possibly. Dr. Henry White my guess is he's associated with Dr. Ebenezer White of Roshan War and Dr. Bartow White of Fishkill. And I know that Bartow White is, has, has family members, Henry, but you can't go by name alone, like genealogy. But those are all Brits. Those are all classical, East, uh, Western, European, Europe, English trained doctors. And then I don't know where to place Chandler. Get some other documents in here if you want to. You'll have that. You have permission to go through it and all that. Doctor, 
Gale, or Doc, Mr. he's known as Mr. Gale in the Senate documents, 1772. This is the John Gale in our county. And um, this 1809 document explains to me the last thing I needed to know to think about training. This, it, and it indicates, beginning at an apple tree at the turn of the road, west of the house of Major John Wood, and running from vets. So that's the edge of the road, that's the edge of the property that was owned by, that the edge of the property is described as the south line, or the farm formerly owned by Dr. John Gale, deceased. So Dr. John Gale lived on a farm, and one of his neighbors was John Wood. So that tells you right there, Daniel Wood somehow, yes, he was probably, he was in the least trained by John Gale. John Gale being in, being in the state congress may not have had enough time and may not have wanted to be the only one to train him. And by the way, he was in a pre-JD position. He, he was a legal document signer who could prove somebody to be a full doctor by making that statement that we saw in the very beginning. But he wasn't going to do it alone, so he said, so he would have sent Daniel to at least one other person who, was, who gave him the apothecary knowledge. The German stuff might have been notes that Daniel would have kept when he was learning to farm as a kid or later on in the state of New York. But we see at least two different people probably had taught him. If, if I were John Gale and told that I'm going to prove him on my own, I'd probably said, no, no, no. I'm not going to prove it myself. It has to have, we need at least one other person to approve him. Two witnesses. So um, that's, that's how my theory is standing right now about how Dr. Daniel Wood became a doctor. What he did afterwards as a doctor, I don't have much idea of. Much, uh, I just have some insights into thinking that he probably just retired and lived a country life and married the, the lady. And they were happy being up in rural area. And he could have, he could have been, he probably was practicing medicine in the neighborhood. To know that, I have to go up to the neighborhood and see what documents there are, ledger books and stuff. So, any questions?